Hi everybody, I have Tiffany here, and Tiffany is not only a CODA, she has two deaf parents, but she also is an ASL teacher for high school students, and I wanted to have Tiffany on because she has so much range of experience from growing up as a native signer, and also her work that she does that we're going to get into a little deeper in a few minutes, that just really ingratiates her into the community. What's really cool is I actually met Tiffany working a cruise, and we figured out that we didn't live that far from each other and we're like score a new interpreter friend <laughs> it's hard to find good interpreter friends that you click with and have that you know connection with yeah and we've gotten to work with each other a few more times after that and we're looking forward to doing another cruise with each other soon yeah excited hello everyone by the way um thanks so much for watching <laughs> So to start off with Tiffany, um, tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up being a CODA and having ASL as your native language. Both my parents, they're completely deaf, so I was the first child. Firstborn usually ends up being the interpreter for both parents. It's just kind of a typical thing for a CODA, which um, stands for Child of Deaf Adults. And my sister is about a year younger than me, so her and I grew up together. Um, we love to sign to each other, um, that's our preference. So that's our first language and basically you start signing at six months seven months old you communicate long before you start talking did your parents tell you what your first sign was uh, my mom did probably mommy or milk I believe is one that one of the two I don't remember exactly which one was first but definitely one of those one two of those, yeah yeah my mom has no idea what my first spoken word was so <laughs> I, but like I'm the second born so that's totally normal <laughs> she probably wrote it down for my sister because <laughs> yeah, I have two sisters and I'm the middle child so oh well that's the yeah. way that's the way it goes though yeah. were you exposed to any other languages growing up actually I was taken care of um, by a Chinese woman my mom's friend's mother she only spoke Chinese by the time I was age six my sister and I moved to the Philippines and we grew up there for about a year and so I was exposed to Tagalog which was um, our home language with our grandma and our uncles and aunts. And, and I'm half Mexican, but uh, my other grandparents spoke Spanish, but we didn't really get to see them a lot. Them yeah, they were afraid we would be confused by too many languages. I have a question for you. How do deaf in the Philippines sign Philippines? There are several signs that in California we use for Philippines. We're talking about a person. Though. I'm, I'm Filipino. They would use the F. I'm Filipino. Or where do you live? Well, of course we say Philippines. And I've so, seen Philippines, that's yeah, been used a lot here. Yeah. yeah. Recently I spoke with a friend, her and her husband moved back to live in the Philippines. And she was telling me about how there's a big push for Tagalog Sign Language to now be used and not lost. I know back, um, I think it was like the early 2000s, there was a strong push in Ireland for Gaelic to be reintroduced into the school so that the Gaelic language would, would not be lost. And then um, I actually met a deaf person from the Philippines and they taught me how to sign Tagalog. Tagalog? Yeah, is it just Tagalog? Or okay, Tagalog. Tagalog. <laughs> Tagalog or I guess sign. It, well, they actually use a lot of ASL, FYI. That's yes. That's, some of the signs they, they sign, like laughing. I know laughing leaves laughing, ha 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 ha, right? That's Filipino sign for laughing or laughing. But you can still communicate. It's like yeah, it's cool. that's what I love when I talk with um, hearing people. They're like, "What? Oh, sign language isn't international. It's not just global." <laughs> you know, obviously that's a question a lot of interpreters and deaf people get all the time. And um, I try to explain to them, "Yeah, it's it's not the same. But if you think about a lot of the Latin languages, uh, Portuguese and Spanish, and uh, all these different languages, you they're not exactly the same. They they're going to be able to communicate. Right. So when you have these different deaf communities in different pockets all over the world, when they come together because they have more similarities they are able to communicate so much easier and when you are going to school to become an interpreter you're like okay I'm going to become an American sign language interpreter but that doesn't give you any training on foreign language sign languages so we need um, those certified deaf interpreters to be involved and in is there any stories that you have from growing up either being a CODA or your, the fact that your parents were deaf as a, a child most of the time being thrust in as their interpreter can cause some really interesting things to happen. Yeah, I, I've had some strange situations, like their friends, another couple who are deaf, and had uh, like a domestic violence situation, and so I had to interpret between the police officers and them when I was probably like seven years old or something. I get used for all sorts of 
interpreting situations. <laughs> um, sometimes doctor's offices for, you know, my parents, and it's just easier. I mean, especially in the 90s or the late 80s, it's really hard to find interpreters. It's not as easy as it is today. So when you were growing up, do you remember a moment when you thought, oh, I, I actually want to do this. I want to be an interpreter. Do you have a moment when that happened? Uh, I actually didn't have that as a kid. I was like, no, <laughs> why would I want to do that? That's not a job. That's what I do all the time. Like, that's who pays for that? It wasn't until I was in my 20s, I started in the early 20s, I started interpreting at church and I did it at night after I worked a full-time job at a bank. And then after that, I realized this feels like home. I enjoy it and I, and I get paid well and it's a lot better than the nursing school that I had gone through before that. Mm -hmm. And you get to see so many amazing places and you see great things and tragic things. Mm -hmm. You know, you, somebody finds out they have cancer, what kind of treatments they're going to have, then there's the giving birth and seeing it like a live and then there's fun stuff like weddings and cruises is a really cool one too obviously and yeah. concerts i just it's so much fun there's just like such a variety it's different every single day yes you have no idea where you're gonna go who you're gonna meet but along the way you make those connections and those patterns and you're like wow like this is just so special so one cool thing about Tiffany is she actually has two YouTube channels. Uh, one is where she makes music videos in sign language, and then the other is she interprets church services for Saddleback Church. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and put links to both of those below so you can check them out, and then hopefully I'll be able to put up a clip of uh, either one of those so that you can take a look at those as well. They tell me I'm too young to understand They say I'm caught up in a dream Well, life will pass me by if I don't open up my eyes So well, that's fine by me So wake me up when it's all over When I'm wiser and I'm older All this time I was finding myself in love Thinking about like the range of assignments that an interpreter fills, do you want like a mix all the time or do you have like a specific like genre? I actually like the spontaneity, is that the word? Just like feeling life with other people who are going through it. It's, I just like seeing the range of things that are available. I, yeah. I just I don't really have like that much of a preference. I'm not open to everything. I actually was able to have the opportunity to possibly interpret for like a really hard rock dark uh, band wow that's a huge completely opposite direction than I've ever done before that's something I wouldn't do I know for myself just trying to find the niches where I excel most and that suit my strengths and one of the things that I just feel really blessed about is I get to go into people's lives at the most precious moments, these moments where it's at a, at a birth or at a graduation, that is super special. And even going into medical um, assignments and, and working with deaf ones who maybe got injured and it's influenced their signing, that impacts their everyday life. And, and then seeing them get stronger and being able to still utilize either their hand or their arm or whatever, their shoulder that was injured. And that like, those are such beautiful moments that I normally shouldn't be in because I have no right being there other than I get to facilitate communication. Yeah, no, there, it's an adventure every day. That's probably what I like the best about this type of work. It's pretty much a privilege and it's amazing. It's so cool. And um, I don't know, I, I just never thought that I would want to be in this industry until I'd gone through so many other types of work. I did nursing classes and then I worked in the hospitals. I liked it, but I was just so sensitive and so attached to the patient, so it was unfortunate that I didn't continue on, but um, you know, then I went into banking, and that was about six years of my life, but interpreting always went into the little crevices of times that I had, you know, I had evenings and weekends, and I always filled it with interpreting, so I was like, hello, that's just like clear as day is that I needed to utilize my skill for such a niche, you know market and it's just it's very competitive still but um, there's definitely room especially the new generation to come in and be mentored just go in full force there's always going to be something that will give you an excuse to quit but if you just don't quit you will get to see so many amazing moments I feel like you're just rewarded for hard work and you can get to travel and you get to just like see things 
in the best possible way. So. Yeah, you get to be in people's lives. I mean, uh, that's messy, but that's what life is. Like we get to be involved in those and that's just like, so yeah. cool. So what was your first job? Uh, as an interpreter, I mean, obviously, you oh. grew up as an interpreter. You wore the label without actually getting paid. But what was like, what was one of your first uh, paid the, jobs? Actually, the church. I volunteered for more than ten years, probably close to twelve or fifteen years. By the time they finally hired me on officially, um, I wasn't paid the whole time. So, but that really like grew my confidence level and like built me up. And then I did. Um, I actually did MLM um, interpreting, and that really was like. A, a really good place to interpret for really uh, articulate speakers on, on stages. Then, of course, the random interpreting jobs, I went mostly into college and universities. So all sorts of really amazing classes. So There's the two classes that I think were the most challenging was microbiology, because like every single thing is spelled. <laughs> and then the other one was I was subbing a pharmaceutical class. And that's all names. And I wanted to be a medical transcriptionist when I was in college. I was fascinated by, you know, these Latin words. But it was also a really long time ago. So, like, I don't remember all of those details. I mean, like, itis, okay, that means swelling, cool. You know, like, edema, okay, I know what that is. Like, okay, there's certain phrases that you just know and you, you pick up on just from life. But that medical terminology class helped a lot because then when I got dropped into that pharmaceutical class, I was like, okay, I don't have any of what they built on. And that's one of the really cool things about working at a college right. is you get to know your consumer, you get to know the, the teacher in the classroom, and you really can form a strong relationship that's just so cohesive, whereas a lot of other assignments, they're so short, they're one-offs, they're a medical appointment, and then you go home and they go home, and you don't usually get to see them again. And you, you hope that they don't have to be back at the doctor's office anyways. So let's not have to meet this way. <laughs> I have a friend at church, see this with me, things open up, there's always doors. Um, so there's a gentleman, a uh, deputy, he works in the Orange County Sheriff's Department. He actually built the ADA system and from, from the ground up. And so he educates all of the sheriffs and incoming brand new officers training what's required of them for ADA law. So they have to follow um, certain procedures and they have to document everything that they do. And deafness is one thing they do cover. They say um, they really emphasize there's a lot of misunderstanding about when someone's walking away and if the cop is yelling at them and they can't hear and they just shoot them or they just tackle them or you know things like that have happened many 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 times and so he's educating them look they might be deaf they might not be able to hear you if, if there's an emergency in a house and you're trying to get their attention you use the flashing of lights on the switch of the of their house you don't just go up and like come up from behind them because that's scary. Yep. So all these things that he really educates every one of them um, so that they do it professionally and they understand that the waving of arms is not them being um, violent or, or aggressive, yeah. aggressive from any sort of drugs and alcohol. It's just their natural cultural thing to do is to be very, you know, gesturing. And um, the difference between hard of hearing who do or don't use sign language and when they have to use a sign language interpreter, it's just like, it's amazing thing. So he actually brought me in. I started teaching them the alphabet and we went through a few videos that I had created. I actually made the videos. Uh, there's a ton of them on my website. If you, oh, you'll you see the link. But um, basically... Yeah, I'll put that link below for you. Yeah, so if you just click on aslhands.com and then there's a, a little link that says ASL videos or you can do slash ASL videos with an S, then it'll populate the whole thing. And it's the EMTs, firemen, um, the police, anything that's more uh, like typical questions you would ask in a, a situation that arises. And what's so cool is Tiffany is going to be launching an ASL series that's even bigger than what she's already put out. She's working on that currently. But not only does she have all that experience, she actually works as an ASL teacher now for high school students. What do you think is the biggest challenge working either with that age group or with um, students who don't have any experience, have never met anyone who's deaf? So what's great is I get to work with a deaf teacher. I have five classes that the deaf teacher is teaching and I voice, so I'm his interpreter. But then the last two classes are my class and those are the ASL3 students. And I completed my first year of teaching. He had mentored me and I had used to work with um, deaf and hard of hearing children in high school and in junior high. So I had a taste of that. And then to go to hearing students who had not really been around the deaf community, but they have a deaf teacher for ASL 1 and 2, they were able to experience one deaf person's perspective. And the beautiful thing is we've had them do a field trip 
and they got to meet lots of deaf people at California School for the Deaf in Riverside. So, so they got to understand like this is way bigger than just one person. You cannot avo avoid the deaf culture and the ASL language. It's just so much beauty. That's what brings us together, makes us feel like family. So it's like really cool. They feel more and more emotionally like bonded to the language and the culture, I think. And the field trip alone was amazing because now that opened up door for this Christmas. We're going to be helping volunteer with the kids. They get to see real world experience. They get to volunteer their hours. They um, use the sign language for real with people that they can't just run away, you know, and go, oh, I'm just going to do it for only five minutes and then talk to my friend next to me, you know? Like they really have to get to know them as, as just, just a human being. And yes. so, you know, they get to socialize. They get to um, serve and they get to use the language for real and it's outside of their comfort zone. It's not within the school, you know. Lots of things I want to just give and give and give to them, so I'm excited. Yeah, <laughs> and that's so rewarding. I remember I was doing some volunteer hours. I actually worked at one of the expos for, I think it was T-Mobile. They had new cell phones and they wanted to share that with the deaf community. And one individual came up and it was back when we had, it was, it was after the, the sidekicks, but it was like a still like a flip kind of style one that, that I don't even remember this class guys, this was a long time ago. <laughs> I don't even remember what it was called, that's how long ago it was. And they kept say talking about something that was on the corner and I, I don't know because like I, I was so new in the language, I hadn't really realized how uh, like how classifiers work and I just I hadn't really played with the language yet and they were talking about how this light would blink for the life of me I had no idea what the sign was I'm like what is that because I learned light as light that is the <laughs> sign for light and I hadn't even learned like overhead lighting or a lamp I hadn't learned any of that stuff or or a spotlight I hadn't learned like the terminology yet and um, just they had a finger spell light like a thousand times I'm so sorry deaf person that you had to do that and I'm so thankful for you <laughs> <laughs> because I, I know all the signs for light now, I promise. <laughs> um, but you get to get involved in the deaf community and you get to go through some of those like troubleshooting moments almost like with the language because you get to see a real person. I, I don't have any deaf members in my family and getting to learn about sign language was just so eye-opening for me. So when I finally got to meet the deaf and just you guys are amazing. Um, just that you guys are all so friendly and kind and patient with those of us who are second language learners and that really inspired me to continue learning the language as opposed to when I was in high school I learned another language. I didn't stay with it and and part of the reason I stuck with ASL is because of you guys. Um, so thank you so much and getting the students to get exposed to the community and be see what a loving and beautiful community it is and getting to have those interactions like now they have this opportunity to be like, hey, my name is so-and-so and fingers spell their name. And then, oh, you're just like me. You just use a different language. That ability to connect with the community that you're bridging that gap. Language comes to life and is much more rich and more meaningful when you know people that utilize it as their everyday, you know, foundation. You actually just went to a, a big conference. It's the first time this conference has been in California. It is the ASL TA, the Teachers Association for Teaching ASL. It came to San Diego recently. And it, any takeaways from that? Yeah, it was amazing because everything was 100% in sign language. There was no voice interpreting, which was so cool. So I felt like I was in my world and it was home for me. Um, lots and lots of people who are complete experts with doctorate degrees from all over the country who teach in universities and high schools and just everywhere, right? And so the best of the best, the networking that I loved, and then the just getting to watch them explain how they teach and how they make it fun for the students, the different games that we've learned and different ways to assess the students from the beginning and to, to like mark all of the growth that they have had. Mm -hmm. The people who are in education, um, I felt like they really love and care about their students. And, you know, we just shared basically what kind of technologies, what kind of software programs we use, um, especially if it's strictly online classes in ASL, which is a little difficult sometimes, but there was just so much rich, um, just like seeing the collaboration between one to two teachers for each workshop, and there's just this wealth of, of um, just 
really knowledgeable teachers wanting to just share everything that they know that can work and just doing it selflessly like that was really cool they're like years and years of teaching and and implement it into my classroom with the other teacher that I'm working with as well so that's so cool it's beautiful yeah definitely is there anything Tiffany that you would like to see more of in the interpreting community or is there anything that you feel is missing in the in interpreting community right now I I feel like um, there's not as much mentorship as there should be um, there is there is a few here and there but it's kind of limited and it could definitely be a lot better also the other thing other interpreters coming together that's it's not that it's not that often I know it's kind of on our own time but I think it'd be nicer to have some sort of like organization where we actually come together and just like brainstorm and like just befriend one another instead of kind of going out on our own a lot of the times uh, it's, it's always a for me it's always a perk when there's a team when there's a second person to work with it can be it can feel a little lonely sometimes but you know if you if you make the effort and you keep the connections like her and I have been doing um, it, it makes it feel like you're not alone and you get to share stories and you know how we felt and the things that we thought and and the things that we're happy and, and thrilled about the things we want to celebrate um, and things that are sad sometimes but you know you just share life together and I think with any kind of community that's that is really essential I think that's kind of not as um, easily found and that's partially what, what so. this channel is, is the ability for us to reach out to each other uh, online because I don't get to meet everybody who is in another state maybe watching this. Feel free to reach out, um, send me a message. Or I am one of those people who loves um, talking with people about the work and um, being involved in the community. Oftentimes, as interpreters, we really focus uh, on the community we serve and, and because of that, we don't always think about, oh, well, what about my community that I... I'm a part of. I'm part of the interpreting community. Just different approaches to the same work, which we don't have a huge forum for right now. So um, IHI is huge about bringing interpreting community together because in the end we are a community and we really need to support each other so that we can raise our profession up. Uh, one other thing I wanted to ask you about, Tiffany, is there anything, either a tangible thing or an intangible thing, that's really adding value to you and your work as an interpreter? Being around people who are who are motivated to learn and to care about one another, I think, you know, makes me feel valuable, and it makes me want to contribute as well. So I work harder, and I I look for ways to be better and look for better people than I am. Um, and so I guess the value is people, like like her. Honestly, like I looked at her work um, on the, one of the cruise ships she was working on, like what who is this girl like I need to know her a new friend <laughs> I was like she's amazing and then it was not just her it was like literally people even younger than me that are from like other parts of the, of the country and I was like they exist and they didn't even grow up with the language they just learned the language a couple years ago and they're killing it like they're just so passionate I'm just like I want to be them so like I definitely think being around other interpreters um, has made me want to be better um, but also, I think obviously the deaf community is the biggest reason that I'm in it and why I'm in that community and I identify myself as sort of deaf because the language is so ingrained in my brain from, from birth or from, you know, baby. So um, I, have, I have two uncles that are deaf and two aunts that are deaf and they've really contributed to me wanting to continue interpreting as well. I've, when I was li living in the Philippines and visiting back and forth, I get to meet lots and lots of people who are in poverty who are deaf through their church and so and my uncle's a pastor so um just the deaf as a whole like knowing their stories and their lives and their like transitions between good and bad you know just like the rest of us is just like holy cow that just like you know that makes me inspired to just keep continuing being involved with everyone that's in that community so i guess deaf community and being with other interpreters, as obvious as that might sound. <laughs> but you know, it adds value, and that's the whole point. So, oh, I actually, do you mind if I bring up something? Yeah, um, go ahead. Also, um, VRS, Video Relay Service, that was one job I felt like actually gave me a lot of value, too. It gave me an opportunity to meet other interpreters. It was actually a good way to learn how to deal with a whole bunch of things. That's a good way to like improve like drastically within six months, as, especially with... Um, with 
uh, receptive skills. Definitely. We actually worked at the same call center and didn't know it because <laughs> our hours were totally different. <laughs> but she's right. What I love about VRS is you're constantly connected to the, the deaf community all across the country. While the call is connecting, you get to have these customer service moments, especially in VRS, um, to greet them with a smile and let them know that their call matters. I got to go to one of Kevin Williams. It was a week-long retreat. There's, there's so much, and um, Kevin Williams is uh, one of the co-creators of the EIPA assessment. We were given a documentation, even if you're not a teacher, if you're an interpreter, you can be part of the IEP um, team, but how do you document that when you go to the IEP meeting? It's not just like, well, I feel like they're getting this concept, but they're not getting that concept, but you have an explanation of why that's happening and what specific struggles that the student's having so that when you are included in the IEP meeting, you have resources. So that's something that's really added value to to my life. Thank you so much, Tiffany, for being on and having this chat with the interpreting community. And definitely you can look below to see the links of how to connect with Tiffany. Check out her two YouTube channels as well as her ASL videos that are on aslhands.com. I'm going to leave you with do good work and share it with people. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. They're not voicing, they're, they're signing, but you, you get what I mean. <laughs> Little yeah. soapbox over. <laughs>